Good morning, everyone. I'm Wen Tao Li from USC Marshall. It's a great pleasure to present my paper and this joint work with Wen Xing and Ben. So this paper studies how intermediaries balance sheets interact with the treasury yield curve. Um, and our motivation is that the treasury, treasury securities seem to become inconvenient after the global financial crisis. If you look at the swap treasury spread, swaps are interest rate derivatives that uh, exchange floating to fixed rates that involve very little risk, and they serve as benchmark interest rate rates. And we know that before the global financial crisis, swap treasury spreads are positive, indicating that treasury yields are low, so they are more valuable, they are convenient. After the global financial crisis, uh, is, the spread becomes negative, indicating treasury yields are higher, so they are less valuable and inconvenient. And meanwhile, we saw this uh, arbitrage margin violation the gaps opened up after a crisis, including CIT base. So in this paper, we explain why the swap treasury spread switched side after the crisis uh, and the connect that with the, the balance sheet cost proxied by CIT deviations and also intermediary treasury positions. Now, the highlight is that there is a regime shift. Before the global financial crisis, dealers net short are net short treasuries, but afterwards, they are net long. So I'm too loud. So maybe without this, good enough. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. Is it okay? Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. So they switch the sign. That's what we call the regime shift. And in different regimes, intermediaries' balance sheet costs enter the treasury pricing in opposite directions. And then we build a equilibrium model. We show that, you know, depending on the regime, these policies could have opposite effects on the treasury yield curve. Okay. Now let me show you some basic facts. So it has been known in the literature that the swaps treasury spread change the sign around the global financial crisis, as you can see from this green line. Um, and furthermore, the CIP deviations become significant non-zero after the crisis in this orange line. Now, what is new here? We bring forward the data on intermediaries net treasury positions in this red line. You can see that it's a switch sign exactly at a similar period as the swap treasury spread. Now, this kind of makes sense. Before the crisis, dealers are net short on treasuries and long swaps. While well, the swap treasury spread is positive, indicating that these dealers are pocketing a positive spread. Now, after the crisis, they switch the sign, while the swap treasury spread also switch sign. Again, you know, they are pocketing a positive spread. Um, and furthermore, we observe that the CIP basis strongly co move with the swap treasury spread after the crisis, indicating that balance sheet costs likely play a major role afterwards. Now, what exactly we do in this paper? Uh, we view the intermediaries as arbitraging between treasuries and the swaps, subject to a balance sheet constraint. Uh, and uh, we're going to use the whole term structure of swap rates and the CIP deviations to construct the dealer long and dealer short curves. So if the treasury yields are close to the long curve, the model says they should long. If it is close to the short curve, the model says they should short. And indeed, in the data, if you compare the treasury yield with these model predictions, the treasury yield shifted from short curve to long curve exactly consistent with what we observed in the data. Now, our exercise uh, contrasts with the two alternative views. One is that the dealers are just like yield-seeking investors, like pension funds and mutual funds, so they load more treasuries when the yield curve is steeper. But in the data, that's exactly the opposite. Okay? And the second is that we contrast with this uh, view of dealers being a classic OTC intermediary, where they take a net neutral position or take a net long position if you're a short constraint. Nevertheless, in the last figure, as you saw, they take a systematically negative position before the global financial crisis. Okay, so once we understand the dealer behavior, we build that into a simple two-period model to understand what are the factors that could drive the regime shift and what are the policy implications. So I'm going to skip over the literature, but uh, at a high level, we contribute to literature by combining an analysis of the swap treasury spread, the CIP basis, the treasury yield, and the intermediary asset price. Okay. So now let's um, take time to think about uh, the treasury trade and the connection with the intermediaries balance sheet frictions. So here we illustrate two trades. One is a, a treasury bond a long position and the other is the CIP trade. Okay. In principle, any no arbitrage violations could work to measure the intermediaries balance sheet cost, but we choose the CIP deviation because it has a rich term structure which is important for pricing treasury securities. So when the dealers launch treasuries, they 
by a treasury bond, they finance in the secured financing rate. Um, and meanwhile, they can also trade a CIP. So they finance in the unsecured dollar and then lend in the synthetic dollar through either forward or swaps. And usually this is the right direction for most currency pairs. Okay. If they expand their treasury position, uh, in order to maintain balance sheet neutrality, they have to shrink uh, other trades. So one example is shrinking this CIP trade. In other words, the foregone profit on the CIP trade is a measure of the shadow cost of expanding the treasury trade. So this is just a graphic illustration of like Lagrangian multiplier approach. Uh, so what should the treasury yield be in this case? Well, it has to be high enough to account for both the financing cost and also the balance sheet cost proxied by the foregone CIP profit. Uh, on the other side, if the dealers are doing a short treasury trade, what they do, they borrow treasury security, sell it in the market, and get cash. And they post the cash with the security lender and earn interest on the cash, okay, which is typically lower. And uh, when they expand the short treasury trade, again, they have to incur losses uh, on the foregone CIP trade in order to maintain balance sheet neutrality. Now, again, in this case, what should the treasury yield be? Well, uh, you know, for the dealers to short treasuries, the treasury price had to be, has to be high, which means the yield has to be low enough uh, and to accommodate not only the lower rate on the cash, but also the balance sheet cost incurred. So at a high level, when dealers long, the balance sheet cost possibly enters the treasury yield curve, while when dealers short, it negatively enters. That's the key intuition for the whole paper. All right, now let's formalize that intuition in a simple uh, model. So let's consider a single dealer's decision that chooses between trading a single imperial zero coupon treasury bond versus the CIP arbitrage. Uh, and here we introduce this risk neutral measure Q that re reflects the dealer's pricing. Uh, now in classic asset pricing, one SDF prices all assets. But remember here, what is special is we consider balance sheet cost, which enters differently depending on whether dealer's long or short. So we use this to price only the zero balance sheet or balance sheet neutral strategies which we constructed in the previous slide. Okay. Uh, and then we define the expected next period bond price as PQ. Uh, now let's set up the intermediaries problem. So they are optimizing their profit subject to a balance sheet constraint. Uh, and the trading here we consider, the one is the CIP trade, uh, which is the multiplication of the syntactic lending spread, which is CIP basis, multiplying the quantity of the trade. Uh, and then they also engage in treasury trade. Uh, when they take a long position, what is the profit? Well, they can sell the treasury next period, which is PQ, divided by the purchase price. Uh, and that's a gross return. And you have to subtract that from a secured financing rate. Uh, and if they short, then next period, they can earn the principal plus cash on the cash collateral. Uh, but they have to buy back treasury, which is the cost. So that's the second point. Right? Uh, and of course, it's subject to the balance sheet constraint, which is important. Um, and this resembles a supplementary leverage ratio. And in reality, you know, in a multi-period model, the expectation of this binding also plays a role. Uh, and furthermore, I want to highlight that this model captures risk adjustment and the risk-based regulation implicitly in the Q measure and the risk adjustment. All right, now we can actually solve this model by pencil or paper. If I gave, gave you five minutes, probably you can solve it. Uh, but let me just directly jump to the result. Uh, so you can see that the treasury price uh, is equal to the next period expected price divided by some discount rate. Uh, now to understand uh, the intuition, let's consider a very simple case, a uh, one period treasury bond, which matures next period. And let's do log linearization. So we have this linear equation. So the, in the law regime, the treasury yield is basically uh, the financing rate plus a balance sheet cost adjustment. And this is uh, just the CIP basis, okay? Um, and, you can express this in terms of a swap treasury spread, which is the green line we observed initially in the graph. Uh, now, it's going to be a minus of the balance sheet cost plus a funding benefit. So let me explain the intuition. So when the intermediaries are long treasuries, and if their balance sheet costs go up, they would require the treasury yield to go up, which means the swap treasury spread to go down. So that's why there's a negative sign, okay? Uh, and also the funding benefit would drive down treasury yield, which means drive up the swap spread. Now, whether this is positive or negative is a battle between the two terms. Before the global financial crisis, uh, sorry, um, after the global financial crisis, we know that uh, dealers take a long treasury position. 
Um, and their balance sheet cost is quite significant, also varies a lot over time. And that dominates that the second term. That's why we observe a negative swap treasury spread. And also that drives a close connection between the CIP basis and the swap spread. Now, in the short regime, we can have a similar expression. We do the simple case, and you can see that uh, the treasury yield now is, uh, has a similar expression. Now, let me directly jump to the swap treasury spread. So now the swap treasury spread has a positive term on balance sheet cost, which is exactly opposite uh, from the long regime. Okay? And then, again, there is, would be a, a term reflecting the difference in the return on cash collateral and the unsecured financing rate. So you can see that both these terms are positive. So why this balance sheet cost positively enters? When the dealers are short treasuries, if the balance sheet cost is bigger, they would require the treasury security yield to be lower to justify them uh, to take the position, which means the swap treasury spread to be bigger. Okay, That's why the balance sheet cost positive enters. So the highlighting point here is that uh, you know, they enter in a different direction. And this re resembles pre-crisis regime where both these terms possibly contribute to the swap treasury spread and make that positive. Uh, and pre-crisis, we know that balance sheet cost item is small, but this item is big and also fluctuates a lot and carries a risk premium. That explains the pre-crisis regime. Uh, now, in order to take seriously the uh, risk premium dynamics and also to get consistency across multiple term structures, we build an affine dynamic term structure model. We basically have the same equation, but iterate over multiple horizons. Um, and we then fit this term structure model to the term structure of swap curves and the CIP curves. And from this, we can construct this model implied dealer long and the dealer short curves, and then compare with the actual treasury yield and give predictions about positions and then compare with the data. So, you know, this is a, probably not surprising that you know, these FI models can do a good job pricing the cross-section of the interest rates. So the swap curve fit is very good. Uh, and you can also see that cross-section of the CIP basis, the model does a great job pricing them. And there's quite some variation across maturities indicating, you know, there's a risk dynamics in the expectation and also risk premium in the balance sheet cost factor. Uh, and then we can compare the actual treasury yield with model generated uh, dealer net long curve and dealer short curve. I know this is kind of small, so let's zoom into a bigger one. So let's see the 10 year maturity. Okay. So uh, according to the model, if the treasury yield is close to the net short curve, they should uh, do a definitely go short. Uh, and you can see that before the crisis, that is exactly the case. So the treasury yield is very close to this red line, which is the net short curve. After the global financial crisis, you can see that the treasury yield jumps to the net long curve. And model says they should definitely long. And uh, if you still remember in the first graph, that's exactly consistent with the actual dealer's net treasury position. Uh, and we can actually do a stronger version of this exercise by defining a so-called relative treasury yield index. So this index measures uh, how close the treasury yield is to the long curve versus the short curve. So if the actual treasury yield is right in the middle, then it's zero. If it's close to the long, then it's more positive. Okay. Again, this relative yield index is constructed from model predictions where we do not feed any treasury information. So think about this as out of sample prediction. And then we also put this together with the dealer's position. So if you add extra assumptions on the model, this relative yield index would predict the dealer's positions. And you can see that that's kind of consistent. And particularly the switching point uh, of the sign from negative to positive. All right, uh, I think so far I convinced you that is a good description of the dealer behavior. And now we're going to embed that into an equilibrium model uh, because we're trying to understand what factors could drive the regime shift and the potential policy implications. Uh, so in this model, we have the same intermediary behavior as I already set up, but we're going to endogenize the treasury yield and also the synthetic lending rate, okay? So the dealers are having the same problem with a balance sheet constraint. Uh, we introduce two types of investors. One is the real money investors like pension funds and the mutual funds. So they are like the yield seeking uh, behavior. Um, and you can see that their demand is an increasing function uh, of the treasury bond holding return 
minus the T bill return. So they're comparing the holding the bond return versus the bill return. If it's higher, they would load more uh, on the treasury bond. Okay, so they're like the yield seeking investor. And furthermore, we also introduced this foreign investors who has their foreign uh, position. Think about this uh, Japanese life insurance companies who have Japanese yen liability, but they want to invest in dollar. So they swap their yen liability into dollar, obtaining effectively a synthetic financing rate. And remember, this is coming from the dealer. So it's going to incorporate the balance sheet cost. Um, and that's their demand function. Again, they're also kind of yield seeking, but their benchmark financing rate is synthetic dollar rate. For each unit of bond demand, therefore they also demand synthetic dollar. Uh, and then we clear the, both the markets. So for the treasury market, uh, the government supplies nominal uh, bonds and the multiplying the price, that's the market value of the total supply, uh, that should be equal to the total demand, uh, which is the dealer demand, which is a Q bond, plus some other investors, which are yield seeking. And you can see that by setting this treasury market clearing in this way, we are actually imposing a pretty strong assumption. That is, when the yield curve, when the term premium is steeper, these other investors are demanding more treasury securities, which means dealers have to behave the opposite way, meaning that your, their position has to be negatively correlated with the, the yield term, uh, with the term premium. Okay, uh, and the way, so then we also clear the syntax lending market where the uh, treasury, sorry, the syntax uh, lending supply from the dealer should be equal to the demand. Uh, but now let's first look at this uh, actual dealer's position and the term premium. That's exactly consistent with our models setup. That is, dealers reduce their position when the term premium is steeper, contrary to the yield seeking behavior like pension fund. Uh, and I want to highlight that it is, a, it is very different from the mechanism of Yarman 2020, uh, where the dealer's position increases when the term premium is higher. All right. Uh, then we solve the model. So for the sake of time, I'm just to summarize the key results. So we get a unique equilibrium featured uh, different regimes. So we have uh, you know, long regime, short regime. Also, there's a less important intermediate regime where dealers take zero position. Um, and the, what drives the regime? Well, there are two factors. One is the bond supply, and the other is the term premium. So before the global financial crisis, the total amount of treasury supply is not as large. And the dealers take a short position, effectively creating more supply to cater the demand. Afterwards, there was a significant expansion of a treasury supply, and the dealer had to take the other side and to subsume the extra supply and take a long position. And furthermore, we have a secular decline in this term premium, uh, which you know, drive down the other investor demand for treasuries. Again, that drives more position for the dealers and the drive up uh, their treasury holding. Um, and uh, our model sheds light on a very important event about the treasury market fragility that happened in March 2020. We all know that typically in time of crisis, treasury yields should go down because flight to liquidity. But in March 2020, uh, the long-term treasury yield actually spiked, uh, which was very unusual. And so far, the standard view from the literature is that it's coming from a large selling pressure from you know, mutual funds and foreign investors, as documented by you know, Hone Negon Song's paper. So I think this paper, we provide a complementary view that does not rely on the direction of the client shocks. So just think about any crisis as a shock to the intermediary's balance sheet, okay? So the balance sheet cost suddenly spiked. If the intermediaries are taking a short position, just like a pre-crisis regime on treasuries, then when the, spike, uh, when the balance sheet cost spike, they would, they're demanding the treasury yield to go down to justify them still in the market and to be marginal. And uh, that drives down the treasury yield. Well, after the global financial crisis, they're taking a long position. So if their balance sheet cost spiked, they are requiring the treasury yield to go up to justify them to be still in the market. Now that provides a complementary view on uh, the event that happened in the, in the pandemic. Uh, and uh, finally, so we can study the impact of different policies on the treasury yield curve and uh, the synthetic lending rates. Well, the caveat is here, we are fixing the swap rates. So everything is relative. Uh, now, I want to highlight that, you know, depending on which regime we are in, the impact of policies on treasury yield curve and the synthetic lending rates could be exactly opposite, as you can see from the directions uh, of these arrows. Now here we study 
uh, quantitative tightening, uh, term forward guidance, supplementary library exemptions, and so on and so forth. So uh, the highlighting point is that the regulators have to pay attention to this regime shift in order to understand the policy impacts on the yield curve and the broader economy. And, and with this, I, I'm concluding. Uh, thank you so much and looking forward to your comments.